Welcome to Unlocking the Truth. This is Reverend Kit Cochran, and today is March 14th, 2022. Um, we are involved in a conflict in the Ukraine, and a lot of people are talking about end times. I've been hearing about end times pretty much my whole life. When I was a kid, uh, I went to Southern Baptist Church. We heard about end times a lot. Um, you know, Y2K happened in 2000. And in 2012, everyone thought that that was the end because the Mayan calendar. Uh, but after living through the end several times, uh, I kind of lost faith that there was an end. But now in 2022, we hear even more religious talk of the end of the world than I've ever remember hearing at any point in my life. Hey, Earl. Uh, you hear a lot of talk online about the end of the world these days? Uh, do I hear a lot of talk about the end of the world these days? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> no, I don't hear a lot of talk about the end of the world. I can't say that. Well, even with all the crazy crises that we hear about on a daily basis with uh, Ukraine and all this kind of stuff, uh, war with Russia, um, I still hear even crazier talk like, Seems like every month I hear of a new asteroid that's about to hit the Earth. Hey, Sam. Hey, how's it going? Thanks Thank for letting me join in. Is. Yeah, I can hear you good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Yeah, okay. We're on here with Earl Schreiber and Sam right. Smith. How are you guys? Blessed. Living another blessed day. Doing this good, is Unlocking man. the Truth, and uh, this is the second episode of, uh, of us talking about the parables of Jesus. Um, on last week's episode, uh, we talked a lot about um, we talked a lot about um, the wicked tenants, and we talked about the sower, and we talked about the mustard seed. Uh, did it, Sam? Did you get a chance to watch last week's episode? Yeah, I didn't get to finish it, but I watched almost all of it. There was a there was a, a little place where I was going off about the the stone that the engineer that the stone cutter didn't want. He cast the yeah. stone aside, and it became the first stone and the last stone. It became the foundation, and it became the capstone. Uh, do you have anything that? you'd like to add about any of that talk about the, the first and last stone? No, there, was man, a, there was a place I, where he was rebuking. The Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus sinning. And uh, his, his apostles, I believe, from the way I understand it, they were harvesting grain on the Sabbath day. And, uh, at, and whenever... Whenever the Pharisees caught them sinning and, and Jesus was there, he kind of interceded and he said, have you not read the scriptures? And I think it's really fascinating how many times that God or that, that Jesus, uh, these are supposed to be religious leaders in the community. And I think it's really fascinating how many times Jesus asked them, have you not even read the book? <laughs> but, <laughs> I think that's really fascinating because these are supposed to be the people who are like lawyers where they could argue every little point uh, and yet Jesus talks to them like, like they're clueless that's amazing how a lot of people who have strong opinions about the Bible or something that have never read the Bible exactly Whenever I started this show, I was told, I can't, you can't be a preacher. You can't try to run a church. And it really bothered me. And uh, it still kind of bothers me right now. 
uh, and why someone would say that. And and it's 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 because they feel unworthy, and and somehow I'm supposed to feel unworthy too. Uh, like I I don't know. The more I read the Bible, the more I I realize that it's the ones who were lost and turned around that are are pivotal in the whole experience whether it be biblical or or today it's the it's a, a perfect example is my guest earl schreiber um on the show uh he is living proof of redemption and um he is uh trying to help other people find redemption uh earl will you just tell us just a little bit about um the place down in Florida that is working miracles for us. Uh, we've sent a few people down there and, and uh, Earl and I have been on this journey. I would say since we were in seventh grade, I'd say we've been kind of on this, this uh, miraculous uh, revelation. Uh, you know, I don't really know how to describe it. A series of miracles, uh, Maybe it's coincidence, but I'll tell you right now, we had a coincidence just before the show started that tells me the whole illustrates perfectly what I what I'm trying to get at. It's very hard to describe to people, but I called you, Sam, probably an hour or two ago and told you that or I texted you and I told you that we were doing the prodigal son. And uh, David, I'm not sure he's on the show yet. He's going to come on and he's going to read the prodigal son. And I talked to Earl earlier, but he didn't know. I don't think we discussed what we were going to talk about. Earl, did we talk about what we were going to talk about? So it, I, I heard you and David, uh, you asking David if you wanted to read the Prodigal Son, <laughs> and uh, it clicked. It clicked with me then. I just now had a chance to uh, verify. You know that. Uh, I, I, I work a program, a spiritual program, and I, one of the things that I, I do I've to, to, help, to help me every day remember that I'm, I'm trying to live this new life. Since my phone is such a big part of, you know, a big part of our lives, I've downloaded a bunch of these apps. And one of these apps, uh, to, it wasn't today's, but it was the day that I read it because I, I didn't even read today's. But I, I read, I read about the prodigal son on uh, on a twenty four hour day uh, app, and I'll I'll read it to you, man. What it says, it says uh, thought for the day. The prodigal son took his journey into a far country and wasted his substance with righteous living, with with riotous living. That's what we alcoholics do. We waste our substance with riotous living. When he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father. That is what you do in AA. You come to yourself. Your alcoholic self is not your real self. Your sane, sober, respectable self is your real self. That's why we alcoholics are so happy in AA. Have I come to myself? And then it goes on about the meditation. It says, simplicity is the keynote of a good life. Choose the simple things always. Life can become so complicated if you let it be so. You will be swamped by difficulties if you let them take up too much of your time. Every, diff every difficulty can be either solved or ignored and something better substituted for it. Love the humble things. Revere the simple things. Your standards must never be the world's standards of wealth and power. Prayer for the day. I pray that I may love the simple things. I pray that I may keep life uncomplicated and free. I just thought that was uh, when you sent you sent me a link to that right before the show started. And uh, the fact that you've been looking at the same thing that we are talking about right now is your your program doesn't necessarily revolve around the Bible, does it? Well, it, it revolves around a higher power. But in this society and in, in me, uh, my higher power is God. And so I'm blessed that these apps that I've got on my phone uh, have Bible references in them. And I, I don't even see the, you know, I, I'm, I'm so new at this 
that I, I it doesn't even register to me that I mean, when I hear the prodigal son, when I read that, I know that it's out of the Bible, but I couldn't tell you what chapter that's out of. I couldn't tell you where in the Bible it's out of, but I know where it applies to me in my life. You know what I mean? I know whenever I read that, I can apply that in my life today. You know what I mean? And, and you mentioned things about the world ending and all this kind of stuff. I can't focus on that, man, because I, I just have to stay in today. I have to be, if I start worrying about all those difficulties out there in the world, all the stuff that's out of my control, man, I'll, I'll be off on all kinds of crazy missions and, and things that are going to complicate my life. You know what I mean? And, and I get so much more whenever I don't worry about that. I just worry about today and try to keep it simple and just focus on, focus on all the good things, you know, and be, live humble in it, be blessed in it. You know what I mean? Just to, it's a blessing to be on here with you guys today. So that that's that's where I get that's that's what I take out of this prodigal son, you know, thing is is it's just a blessing to be here, man. So well, we're gonna talk a little bit about where in the Bible the prodigal son is, and we're gonna talk about um its arrangement. It's actually part of three other stories. And uh, I feel like every time I read one of these stories, I get something else out of it. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about these three stories, and we're also going to cover the rich man and Lazarus. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Good Samaritan. And all five of these stories have some real gems uh, for how to live your life and things to just constantly meditate on to, to, to see that you're on the right path. Uh, Pastor Sam, would you mind praying with us? He's Can you muted. pray for us before we start? Yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for this opportunity to get together and study your word. I pray today that you would open our hearts and our minds. God, you'd show us what you'd have for us to learn and understand. Use us today to be a, a light, not just to those that are here right now, but those that may watch this later on to truly open hearts and minds for you. Nothing would hold us back today. Your spirit could flow freely. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So um, before I get started on this topic, uh, I wanted to touch one more topic uh, about our community here. Um, Sam, when we first started this, it was a real small thing. Um, we weren't really sure what it was going to be. Um, it became um, a talk show. Uh, it's kind of a confessional. Uh, it's a little bit of a Bible study. Um, we, we've even done episodes where we talked about uh, um, like modern events and things like that. Um, we've, we've kind of tried, struggled to figure out what we want to do, uh, but um, we've, we thought about charitable projects we could be a part of. Um, my friend Earl there has some really good ideas and things that, that he would like to do, and we're all game for trying to help him out. Um, one of those projects involves, um, uh, he, he found an opportunity where it may be possible to have an AA meeting on a, a Zoom call like this, and if we could have this meeting uh, where we were helping a, a, an audience that, that really needs our help, that'd be great. And uh, one thing that has presented itself to us a couple of times is uh, talking to prisoners. That that and, and there's there's a me, there's I'm not sure which passage it's in, but there's a passage where Jesus talks about visiting the sick, and he talks about visiting people that are in jail. And I I think that um, that's probably something that most people don't really even think about doing. Uh, but there's a lot of people in prison who need redemption. And, and if there's some way that we could make that happen, I'm game for it. Uh, but I know, that, I know that because of COVID, a lot of uh, technology has really expanded, especially in some of the rural, uh, you know, jail cells and, and places like that. I know most of the uh, court proceedings, some of the inmates have even done from Zoom. So with uh, internet becoming more available, because I mean, there for a while, 
they didn't have high speed internet in Delaware County, but they've got it available now through Bolt and it's being expanded to a lot of different uh, places like that. So they've been able to do uh, Zoom meetings for visitation for families, been able to do it for court proceedings. And I think they could even do it for uh, some of this type of, uh, you know, rehabilitation and improvement and stuff like that. I think that'd be a great idea. I'm all in on that, man. I, I would dedicate the time in my life to participate in that and, and to help, to help, man. So uh, if, if at any chance we decide to spark that, you definitely have me and an ally in, in making that something that I, I would definitely, you know, take part in. So. All right. I know that uh, Roy goes to our church. He's actually the uh, jail, tra jail chaplain here for Delaware County. And we're trying to get something started in Ottawa County too. Um, can we talk to him on Thursday night? I have this Thursday off because it's spring break. So it'd be a good time yeah. for me to try to come. I don't have eSports. Usually I have eSports on Thursday nights, but it would be a good week for me to come to meet Roy. Absolutely. Are you down for Thursday night? I, yeah, I'm down. I actually know Roy. So that, that'll be a pleasure getting reacquainted with Roy. Cool. Okay, well, we'll plan on doing that this Thursday. Okay, so um, we're unlocking the truth about the parables of Jesus. Uh, we got the lost sheep is a part of a group of um, parables that go together. It's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And so it'd be appropriate if we read these all together. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and just read straight out of the Bible, all of them in succession, and then we'll discuss. The parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts, on, puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who rep repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is um, actually, this is the exact reason why me and Robert started talking about this stuff when I was in church camp, uh, back when I was a kid, um, my big thing was if we want to be more like Jesus, we would, we would go outside of the church and we would talk to the people who truly need our, t need our help. And I talked at that time about modernizing the music, um, trying to play more rock style of music to try to get people in the seats so you could teach the word to them. And I tell you, I was, it might be hard to believe now because that's the way a lot of churches are. But back in the early 90s, I was looked on as, uh, um, I, I was an evil person. Uh, Robert can attest, uh, I think he was in the room at the time and I was almost ostracized instantly for some of the things that I was saying. Um, but in my opinion, it's right up Jesus's alley. He's a rebel. The parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, this, this coin, it's not a, it's not a penny. This is a uh, 10 shillings or I don't know what it is. It's, it's 10, 10 silver coins. I read a thing somewhere on there. It said that's about a week's pay. So we're talking about a week's pay here. This is a $500 bill, not, not a penny. Um, the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued. 
There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off on a distant to the distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, <coughs> who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to feel, fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What is going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fat, fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, has, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, the ending of this story, just like the story that we read about Noah, I think the ending of the story is part that doesn't get talked about very much. It's the brother, older brother's reaction, I think, that is really the, the core point of this story. And it's kind of similar. Whenever we read in Jonah, Jonah went and told the people that they had 40 years until their city would be destroyed. They repented immediately, and God forgave them and didn't destroy them. And Noah spent the rest of his days mad because the people weren't destroyed. They heeded his warning, and he was mad about it. <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing we're seeing here with this older brother. The older brother uh, was, you know, he, he feels cheated. Uh, he feels like he's been there the whole time. He played by the rules, and he gets the same thing as his brother gets. So, so too, so too can we have Christians in our church that when a person comes and they've, they've led a, a, a bad life, and they come and they seek redemption, and when they receive redemption, you know, people can talk behind their back. People can um, spread rumors. That's one of the Ten Commandments right there, is to not spread false witness. And I think it's one that a lot of people forget about. Now, um, there is a parallel to this. And we're talking about the younger son and the older son. Think about in the context of the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jew as the older brother has always been there, always done what they were supposed to do. And all of a sudden, this younger brother comes in, and he's the favorite right off the bat. And uh, there's a parallel there. 
And I think what Jesus is trying to say is something along the lines of that the Jews should welcome the Gentiles into the body of Christ, the church. Does anybody, anybody have anything to say about what they've read about the, the, the lost son? Man, what as as you were talking there uh, and reading that, and you you said something about how uh, you know whenever people are seeking redemption, they get redemption, and then people you know talk behind their back. And I was thinking about that today. I was thinking about why I'm an addict and I'm I'm an alcoholic, and I was thinking about why why it's so hard and the hardest thing uh f- for me is dealing with other people man and and how i cover up myself with drugs and alcohol whenever you know because I, I feel a certain type of way about how how i think somebody views me or how i think somebody talks about me and so it it gives me fuel to this to feed this demon you know what I mean? That that's always with me. And I, I, I would have no problem if, uh, I, I say that I, I think it would be a whole lot easier if I, if I didn't think about so much about what people are saying about me and how, you know, how people view me, you know, cause I, it's, it's a battle in my head that I constantly am, I'm having to say, you know, that's not right. That's that old crazy thinking. And so I, I, I liked what you had to say there. It, it really struck a chord with something I was dealing with, you know, t- today, you know, and dealing with other people and, in, and why, why, uh, why they're acting a certain way, you know? So I, th- I think that you're right that, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't talk about other people in any kind of a bad way. You know what I mean? So this is, I think a, the premise, this, is this is a part of, I think the whole, go ahead, Sam. I was going to say, I think the whole premise of that story is, is kind of uh, focusing on those who have uh, disdain or looking down their nose at people who don't look like them or smell like them or talk like them or have the same background. Um, you know, Jesus goes through those three things talking about, you know, money, possessions, and, and family that I think hits everybody with, you know, those three things that are things that are lost. And then the attitude of the of the older brother, you know, it's attitude of a lot of churches. Uh, if you come into our church, you got to look like us, dress like us, you know, sing the same music we do, uh, read the same type of version of Bible that we do, um, or we don't really want you as a part of it. Most churches have all that insider stuff. We got insider jokes that we make about things in church. And if you don't fit our mold, then you're not really accepted. And that's, I think that's what Jesus was getting at. You know, the Pharisees, the lawyers, the Jews, they had their own little way of things they wanted it to be. And if you didn't fit in their mold, they weren't interested in having you be a part of anything. Certainly not the Gentiles and certainly not Anybody that probably was willing to go their way, like Jesus, they weren't interested in that and trying to catch him every step of the way, you know, come after him, make some kind of accusation on it. But I think uh, I think the big message there is for churches to not be so judgmental. Some guy comes in, you know, stoned out of his mind. How is your church going to react? Or if he's drunk, smells like alcohol and sits down in a chair next to you, what's your attitude? Is it, oh, man, why is this guy in church? It needs to be, man, this guy needs to be here. I'm so glad he's here. I hope he gets what he needs. If he goes to the altar, I'm going to go with him. You know, that's the kind of attitude that we need to have rather than having the attitude of the older brother. I think that's a little bit of uh, the issues that we run into when we're talking about, when we're talking to non-believers. Uh, especially when they point to hypocrisy in the Bible, when they they sometimes argue things that are from the Talmud or or legalistic ideas from Judaism, and they put it on what Christians believe. But 
um, Jesus radically fought against a lot of those principles. And so they're actually opposed. And so um, it's a difficult thing to argue with people without getting into a big old long discussion. Um, and that's one reason why I'm trying to uh, read the Bible more often is so I can find those those quick answers. I can get them to come to me. You know, if I have an issue, I can I can find I, I can I can come up with that right passage in my mind Rolodex to, to, for that particular thing. Um, these two are really good ones too. Let's, let's go on with the lost sheep and the lost coin. Let's just talk about it a little bit more in depth. So the lost sheep, he says, you have to leave the 99 out in the open in order to get the one that's lost. And just like with the coin, he rejoices when it's found and he tells his neighbors and everybody. So what's he talking about right there? He's, he, he is talking about the depths of his grace and mercy. He's talking about um, he's talking about the 99 righteous people didn't need it. So so it, this this really reminds me of was it what mom tried to remind me of when we were talking. Maybe, Robert, you remember um, we were talking a little while back uh, about um, someone who is jealous like this um it was maybe job uh or was it elijah uh where they they were they were angry because the sinner had the lamp given to him had the light given to him we were talking about when we talked about the city on the hill and we were talking about a light in the darkness i think i think our topic was light and we were talking about light and darkness and in that, we talked about how the light was given to the person who was in the dark. You remember, or talk, Earl, you were on the show, because I remember you talking about, we were talking about a person has nowhere else to go. They have no other way to turn. And that's who Jesus blesses. Because they have no, they're, they don't have any other way to turn. Do you remember talking about that? I can't remember. I can't remember what passage that was in, but I know it was from the when we were talking about light and darkness. I, I do remember that. I, I don't remember the passage at all. Uh, anyway, that was so, quite a while back. Yeah, I'll have to. That's one reason I love how we can film this conversation and we can watch it again later because I always go back and I find things that lead to whole new conversations. So just by talking about it right now, I'll go back and maybe we'll discuss it next week. But there's a there's a parallel to the Old Testament here that uh, I can't quite think of. But essentially what he's saying is that the one who really needs repentance is the one he's going to work on and go after. And if you got 99 people who go to church all the time and they're basically leaving pretty righteous lives, that they may not see a lot of change. Sometimes it can become boring a little bit uh and, and and it's it's hard to stay on fire whenever you know you're not seeing like if, i guess if you're not around a, a lot of darkness you don't see quite as many miracles i don't know i, I maybe that's not true um maybe by being in the church you, you know you're you have a community so you see a lot of people that have sicknesses and i know uh pastor sam deals with a lot of tragedies uh, that that I'm sure um, you know he doesn't have to uh, be around a lot of uh, sinners to 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 see uh, the darkness of the world and, and that kind of thing. But um, uh, I think what he what it's trying to say is 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 some sometimes the people that go to church all the time are not seeing radical change in their lives necessarily unlike if you see if you go down to skid row and someone someone um repents on skid row or let's say it's a crack hotel or maybe it's uh the corner with the prostitutes i mean if one of them changes their life god is going to rejoice to all high heaven over something like that because they were so lost i mean just it, it's the same thing with there like this coin here this coin illustrates it perfectly 
she has other coins. There's other coins in her purse, but she's not yelling out her window at the neighbors. Hey, I found my coin of the coins that are in her purse. It's the ones that she lost that she's happy that she found. Hmm. Well, I, I think it's, it's the ripple effect. Like when, uh, when I've taken on this, this new way of living and I've started, I've started this new way. Uh, I got six, I'm six months into doing this. You know what I mean? And I've helped eight people get into treatment. You know what I mean? So by, by God shining his light and, and by the miracle in my life and, and how I'm feeling, I'm go, I, 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 li- I lived in the darkness. I'm, I'm not scared of the darkness. I, you know, I, that's, that's where my world was, was in the darkness. So I'm, I'm able to, to, to still be part way in the darkness because th- those are the people that I was just with, you know what I mean? So it's, right. it's, e- it's easier for me to, to sh- shed that light than for, you know, cause that, that those people that are out there lost in the darkness, they're, they're not going to just end up in church unless the right circumstance happen. You know what I mean? They're not going to end up trying to, trying to get recovery unless the right circumstances happen. But whenever, whenever you are, whenever a miracle happens on Skid Row, whenever a miracle happens in that, you know, that realm of people that, that, you know, a lot of churches shun and a lot of, there's that stigma, you know what I mean? Uh, But whenever there is that miracle that happens there, that light's able to expand and that, that light's able to, to grow, you know? And, and I, I, I feel like that's, that's the part of, of the, you know, Jesus and, and, and the whole religious aspect of it, you know, it's, it's about spreading that and, and, and making that miracle happen over and over and over and over again. And then the, you know, the, the eight people so far that I've helped get into treatment, you know, who knows how many people they're going to help get into treatment you know what i mean yeah that's the mustard seed yeah i would even say i would say the the story about the the shepherd also is about urgency i mean we think about i mean earl if somebody if somebody called you right now and one of the people you're sponsoring said hey man i'm thinking about going out and and ruin my my sobriety i mean you get off here and you go talk to them you'd leave us and, and you'd go to somebody that needs you and you got what you need. I mean, kid, if one of your kids called, uh, one of your students called and said, hey, I'm, you know, I got a gun to my head. You'd be like, hey, I got to get off here, guys. I got to take care of something. It's an emergency. It's urgent. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I guess that maybe I'm thinking about how it speaks to me, too, as a pastor. You know, there I know a lot of pastors who don't give out their cell phone to church people or anybody or anything like that because they don't want people calling them. Or disturbing them, and I know everybody needs a time to get away and stuff. But sometimes we don't see the urgency of ministry. We say if they need help, they'll show up at church on Sunday. Man, that, mm-hmm. that ain't the way ministry works. And I think even Jesus talking to the people he was talking to, primarily those Pharisees, and and that mindset was, you know, there's there's urgency right now. That sometimes you got to leave the ones that don't need it and get that message out to people who are stuck, who are hurt, who are lost. You know, that's. I don't know. I mean, that's just kind of my my simplistic way of understanding it. That Jesus was doing that with the lost people, and people were definitely trying to catch him in something, accuse him of something. Mm-hmm. Yep. So another one that I want to talk about, one of the ones I've been reading the most this week is the rich man and Lazarus. As you can see behind me, this is Lazarus. And uh, if you can see, there's a dog that's licking his wounds. Let me see if I can show you on this screen. There's a dog here licking Lazarus's wounds. And uh, he's sitting at the gate of a rich man. And uh, let me just go ahead and read this out loud. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen. Purple is really expensive. Uh, That's the uh, color of royalty back in Roman days. And lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. 
The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to, to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us, he answered. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Uh, so you might, the first question most people ask themselves is, didn't Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And from what I could find in my re research, the name Lazarus means God is my help. And um, they, it's, they're, not, they're not related. They've, they've been conflated together. But from the Gospel of John, uh, they're talking about Lazarus of Bethany. And no one really knows who the who the rich man is and people speculate who they think the rich man might be uh but uh pastor sam uh, we just happened to bump into each other the other day and he was bringing uh up something about the rich man uh can, do you mind expanding on this sam no uh most at least i guess most bible scholars that would talk about this uh believe that this parable story is actually a true story if you kind of look at the stories that jesus gave his parables uh one reason why they say it is because it's the only parable that he uses an actual real name uh, every other one's a certain woman a certain man a uh, certain father all that kind of stuff so this is the only one that gives a real name and uh if it is a true story it obviously gives us a pretty interesting glimpse uh at things that happen in the afterlife and it's where sometimes we get some of the pictures that we have of, of what happens after a person dies and things like that. But if that's uh, that's true, it's definitely an interesting picture for sure. I've, I've watched a lot of uh, near-death experience videos on YouTube. And uh, th there are some that talk about being in a dark pit filled with people biting each other and things. And these are atheists. These are not Christian believers. These are people that got hit by an SUV and they hate God and they had no intention of going to talk to Jesus, don't even know how to pray. And and uh, one in particular that I listened to, he remembered some prayers from when he was a kid. And he first started, he's, he's in hell and he's surrounded by beasts. And there's huge beasts in the corners, he says, uh, that are like generals or something of these creatures. And he says he could see heaven up above. He could see it up, there's no way you could get to it. And it reminds me of this story. Uh, but this this person, what he said is that he, he remembered, he tried to remember how to pray while he was in hell. And he he started to say the 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 pledge of allegiance <laughs> he had he he didn't even know where to start like he started with the pledge of allegiance and um a, as he started to try to remember it he found little pieces here and there um walking through the shadow of the valley of death he throws out a few little pieces of the of the lord's prayer and he noticed that the the demon started running away from him and he said by the time he actually remembered a piece of the prayer, he was 
all by himself. And the beast <clears> was far from him, and he could hear him breathing in the distance, but but they had completely vanished from his sight. And, mm -hmm. and that as he started to remember more of the prayer that he was basically allowed to come back to earth and live out the rest of his days. This is this is coming from the lips of a person who is uh, an atheist and doesn't believe in any of this. Uh, like I said, could could not even figure out how to say a prayer. Uh, so uh, I did. My point was that that this guy told a story where he could see heaven up above, and there was no way to get there. And I've heard that a few times from people who said that they've crossed over and come back. Hmm. so the two men named Lazarus the rich man has no name although he's been given various names in later history such as Dives which means rich in Latin by contrast Lazarus is the only name given to anyone in Jesus's parables it means El Azar God has helped there appears to be no connection between Lazarus and the re resuscitated man in John 11, 1 through 44. This says that there's a conflation with Lazarus of Bethany. The name Lazarus, God is my help, also appears in the Gospel of John, in which Jesus resurrects Lazarus of Bethany four days after his death. This up here, I like how they say resuscitated. If, you're four, if you've been dead for four days, are you resuscitated? Not sure. <laughs> Historically, wow. within Christianity, the begging Lazarus of parable feast day, June 21, and Lazarus of Bethany feast day, December 17th, have sometimes been conflated with some churches celebrating a blessing of dogs associated with the beggar on December 17th, the date associated with the Lazarus of Bethany. Romanesque iconography carved on portals in Burgundy uh, that which is in France and Provence might be indicative of such a conflation. For example, the West Portal of Church of Saint Trophime at Arles, the beggar Lazarus is enthroned as Saint Lazarus. Similar examples are found at the Church of Avalon, Central Portal, portal of Vizelle, and the portals of Cathedral Aten. So uh, there's a St. Lazarus. Kit? Yes? The, uh, the stories um, in church and everything that I've ever heard about was Lazarus was a good, good friend, close friend of Jesus. And when he died... Um, and I don't know what where he was or why it took so long for him to come to their house, but the daughters and I don't think it was Mary, was it Sam? One of the daughters. It wasn't Lazarus' sisters were Mary and Martha. Oh, okay, it was Mary and Martha. Okay, yeah. so um, when he came, one of the one of the girls said where have you been? If you had been here, you could have saved him, you know, and Jesus wept. So what I kind of got from that is he was very close to Lazarus. And of course he was close to Mary and Martha. And when he came and uh, chose to raise him from the dead, but it wasn't any of this other stuff. It was just a simple, you know, that, he there was another miracle Jesus could do and did chose to do uh, another part of that story that I recall um, is that Lazarus was in the room when Mary washed Jesus's feet and Jesus said that when this message gets spread all over the world that she should be remembered what she did there when she she washed his feet with expensive perfume now his reaction is peculiar to weep uh, because of the fact somebody else asked him uh, asked him about Lazarus, and he just kind of coldly says, "Oh, he's just sleeping. He's not dead." Hmm. So the fact that he cried 
when when the sister said that leads me to believe it's not he's not crying for Lazarus's death obviously because he knows he's about to bring him out of his sleep so mm -hmm. I, it sounds to me like he's you know there's there's several places in the bible where they talk about people weeping and being blessed because they're weeping so i i, I i'm assuming there is a virtue in the sorrow that we feel and I don't really I think know. Jesus, oh, I was going to say, I think he probably was crying because Lazarus' sister was there crying too. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think probably when we hurt, I think God hurts too. When we have a yeah, hurt. Yeah, he was man. Sad, he was a sad, man. I, I think he probably feels our pain in that part of it. And like you said, he knew what he was going to do. Um, but I think that probably was something that when he saw the pain in Mary's and Martha's heart and life because of their brother they felt their loss i think mm -hmm. that drew him to that too that's just yeah, my I opinion on it. yeah i'm not i never i guess i never even thought or would draw the line between the two being the same individual or anything like that but i just you know felt like it was interesting you know if it if it's a true story it definitely gives us a good picture of what uh some parts of hell would be like you know, the one part that would have been called Abraham's bosom, you know, separated by golf. It's not heaven because uh, obviously if it's a true story, uh, nobody could go to heaven yet because Jesus hadn't been on the cross. Right. And, I saw uh, something about that saying that there was a fire there, but you don't go in the fire until after the judgment. Yeah, that's that's usually what's talked about later on. I think sometimes we think about hell Right now, we get it confused with Dante's Inferno. But, uh, you know, Hades or the Lake of Fire is usually reserved for, you know, after we get through Revelation, pretty much. But there, you know, it was called a place of torment right now. It could be fire. It could be all kinds of things. You talked about uh, the beasts, you know, there in the room with you. You know, that would definitely be tormenting. Uh, darkness be tormenting. Uh, just uh, with this rich man not having something to drink, that would be tormenting. I mean, they're definitely a, a air of torment no matter what he was going through. But uh, some, and I, I'll kind of go down a little bit of a path on this. I know this uh, with being what's called Abraham's bosom. Uh, some people believe that's what Jesus was talking about when he mentioned paradise, when he was on the cross. You know, because when he died on the cross, he didn't necessarily go straight to heaven. Uh he spent some time within the earth, you know, preaching. And, uh, but some individuals, you know, would say that, that paradise or Abraham's bosom, if they're the same place, they're, they're empty now. But even some that are from the Catholic faith, that's what they usually call purgatory. Yes. Mm -hmm. I read that, yeah. Yeah. And, so, uh, so the idea is that, that they're being yeah, held somewhere until the Messiah comes back. And, uh, and at that point, all the dead will be raised. Well, let's move on to the Good Samaritan. Uh, we got about ten minutes left, and uh, oh, looks like I didn't, I didn't do the, I didn't write anything for that. So let's, I'll just talk about what I've understood from the Good Samaritan. Let me Google it real quick, and we can read part of it. Uh, but part of the 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 idea about the Good Samaritan, a lot of people think that um, that the story is just about being a good person and giving to charity. And there's a lot more to the story than just that. Okay, so we're reading here. Let me switch to the uh, King James Version. What, what version of the Bible do you read out of, Pastor Sam? I read a lot of different ones. I, I probably prefer the King James only because I memorized a lot of verses out of the King James. And if I had to learn them out of something else, it'd be difficult to memorize them. <laughs> Maybe laziness on my part, but I like, I like a lot of them. ESV. I really like to read out of too. All right. This is another one of those stories that uh, seems, seems on the surface to be one thing. And then when you read it again, you get a lot more deeper meaning out of it. So let, let's all just listen while I read. 
And okay. behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor exactly? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and, de and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the, at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own breast and brought him into an inn to care for him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whosoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now, which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. So this guy gets beat up by a bunch of thieves, robbed of everything. And a priest is walking by. And the priest walks completely on the other side of the road. Is disgusted by the guy and doesn't even want to look at him, right? Then a Levite comes by. A Levite is one of the Jewish priests, uh, the Hebrew priest from the line that was not supposed to drink and to be pure and and they're supposed to grow their hair long and so these guys are looked upon as the a tribe of priests and this guy again walks completely on the other side of the road now i've heard a few people talking about you know different excuses of why the priest might have done that maybe he's trying to keep himself pure because he's getting ready to go to the temple and make a sacrifice and he wouldn't be able to do that if he got his hands dirty. Uh, but the point is, Jesus is telling this story. So there's no reason to argue with any of it, because obviously Jesus is trying to make a point here. And it's not about making excuses for why or justifications of why these guys might have done that. Uh, so you can just skip right over that whole idea. The, whole, the point of the story is not necessarily just about giving charity to the poor or the people who need it uh but it's a lot about these pre priests they they feel like no one was watching and uh um they they thought that that uh if if they walked right past they could make it up in other ways they, they've done plenty of good and so there's no reason for them to help this time uh, and I think there's a lot of people kind of like that within our church congregations and within our, you know, our friend groups. Um, they're willing to help when it's convenient. Uh, but when someone really needs them, they look away. A matter of fact, I, I watched a football game for right at the Super Bowl. I saw a video of uh, what's his name? Stafford for the Chargers. Uh, what's his first name? Matt. Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford was on the stage with someone, and it looked like they were uh, choreographing some kind of dance or something. I don't know. She's standing on the stage talking to him, and this girl just falls right off the stage. <laughs> and immediately, his reaction, I don't know how the guy's even on this team anymore. They got 
The guy just takes a big drink of water and starts to walk away because he doesn't want anyone to see him standing by the girl. His immediate reaction was not to dive off the stage and help the girl. He just like turns and acts like he just sips his water like, do 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 do. I'm not. I didn't see that happen. Uh, that that to me, that's the story of the Samaritan right there. Uh, not helping when people need your help, uh, regardless of who they are. The, the other part of the story that you really got to keep in mind is that the the Samaritan is an outsider. This is a person who's seen as not not worthy to come to the temple. They they don't get to come to the church. They're so so they're looked down upon. Um, you could easily have this be a race story, and there's a lot of stories in modern culture that uh, are race stories that were are kind of like this. Um, um, so this is a this is a group of people that are looked down upon and despised. Um, the other part of the story, down at the bottom, uh, really the guy gives a, a hotel the money, and he says that he's going to put the guy up. He's going to put the guy up. It says two pence, and I looked at a thing that said that two pence was roughly a month's wages, like to buy it for to buy a hotel room i'd buy you a room for a month so can you i mean he doesn't even know this guy this this guy picked him up put him on his horse poured expensive wine and oil on the guy's wounds took him to a hotel got him a month's rent and then he stays there with him overnight and he tells the innkeeper if anybody else puts money up for this guy when I come back, I'll pay his bill. The point Jesus is trying to make is that you have to treat people as you want to be treated. This guy is treating this guy how he would want to be treated. If you were beat up and robbed, you would hope someone would buy you everything you needed for a month and put you up and stay with you overnight, nurse your wounds. I mean, how many of us ever really treat someone like we want to be treated it's probably pretty rare you know in the in the in the short term yes but this guy is lavish like think about really really what you want to be treated like well i'd really want to be put up for a month at a hotel you know what i mean and that's you know just handing someone your sandwich is not quite the same as this this is like stocking someone's whole fridge <laughs> you know uh, and, and i'm giving them everything you got and, and and this priest, he thinks that by doing whatever he's doing in that church, that it excuses him from this duty of treating someone how he would want to be treated. Hmm. The one thing we see is the guy, the guy who's the Samaritan, he definitely had no real obligation to help him out. He wasn't the same race. He probably wasn't a medical professional, but he, he did it. And I think that's the point of what Jesus was saying. They weren't neighbors. And that was the whole point of who yeah. the, the guy was trying to narrow down. Does it have to be the guy that lives next door to me? Or do they have to live in my same neighborhood? You know, maybe the same street, maybe even go to church with me. Is that who I have to call my neighbor? Because I don't want to call anybody that needs help. My neighbor, especially if they're not the same race, and especially if it's not convenient, especially if it's going to cost me something. I, I don't know if I want to help that kind of person or be a neighbor like that. So, Right. It doesn't mean I'm taking cookies around the neighborhood and giving them to all my neighbors necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the guy was looking for some kind of a, some kind of an out. You know, the lawyer yeah. that was questioning him, he was, his intentions were bad right off the bat, thinking, you know, is there an exception? Is there someone I don't need to help? And it's easy to help your neighbor you know and like, but it's not easy to, to help that neighbor that, uh, that you, you may even ruin your reputation by being seen with them. Yeah. All right, guys, it is 7.02 and we've done a full hour. This concludes our, our second week on uh, parables of Jesus. I'd like to do a third week. Uh, let's look at um, the ones we've covered so far. 
So let me uh, go through our topics, okay? So, so far uh, we talked about the mystery. We talked about, uh, last week we talked about uh, the wicked tenants and we talked about the laborers in the vineyard and we talked about the mustard seed. In the past, we talked about the treasure. We talked about the sower. Quite a while back, we talked about the lamp. And uh, today we covered the lost sheep, the lost son, the lost coin, the rich man and Lazarus, and the good Samaritan. And so uh, next week, some of the things that we have not covered yet, uh, the wedding feast, uh, the persistent widow, uh, the Pharisees and the tax collector. So there's lots of lots of interesting parables to still talk about. And so uh, any of the ones we haven't covered yet, let's try to cover them next week. Sam, do you think you can make it again next Monday? I'm going to plan on it. I've got to go out of town, but I'll be back in town, I think, by then. So. Okay, well, we're flexible with our schedule. We call around and try to get a consensus. So... Um, uh, we, we usually uh, talk on text message. I got you in the text group. And so yeah. if uh, plans change or anything, just let us know. Uh, I sure, sure enjoyed having you on the show. We liked hearing your perspective. Thanks for letting me be a part of it, man. I appreciate it. All right. So that concludes this week's show. Uh, Robert, Sam, you guys have a great week. Love you guys. Hey, man. You take care. Thanks. Yeah. Good show.